Thank you all so much for joining us for episode four, season four of our Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Boland, an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. So, Kim, when it comes to research, we often use words to ask people about their attitudes, behaviors, opinions, experiences. We survey people, we interview people, but... There's another way that we can study history. And so, yes, stick with me. Um, <laughs> have changed this podcast to history PhDs all of a sudden. Not to knock historians. They're great. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to say something, and I want you to tell me what comes to mind. 9-11. Hmm. Okay, so I have a lot to say. Uh, <laughs> what comes to mind are actually a bunch of images rather than words. Hmm. That's what first comes to mind. When we see 9-11 referenced in history books or in the media or when we're doing like the anniversary of 9-11, we tend to see the same images over and over. Mm. I see the photo of one of the planes striking the tower. I see the pictures from street level of people literally running for their lives. And it's like you can almost see the explosion behind them in the frame. Mm -hmm. And I see the image of the firefighters raising the flag at ground zero. Mm -hmm. So that's what I see. And I think they tell very, very different stories. But I have to ask, what about you? What images come to mind when you hear 9-11? So definitely all of the same images that you mentioned. And then, I mean, I I think about about that day and I have memory, maybe slight more unique images. Um, Mm -hmm. So things that I remember that I was doing on 9-11, I was working in a preschool at the time. So I remember watching the news on this like tiny little TV (laughs) and I can like see that office. And I remember lines at the gas station. I remember even having class that night in the first uh, floor lecture hall in Doster Hall. And I cannot tell you any other classes that I had in what room, <laughs> what semester. So it was like, it was a, a memory, right? And you can see it. Yep. And you know, the saying and spoiler, this comes up in our conversation. A picture is worth a thousand words. Is, isn't it a thousand words, right? Yep. Uh, yep. And I wonder if we wrote down what came to mind when we were looking at one of the more shared public images from 9-11, how many words would we write? And how much shared memory would we have? And how many meaningful, unique experience might we share as well? Um, Or not share, but be able to talk about in maybe a thousand words, maybe more, maybe less. But those those images are are, hmm, they're really um, interesting to think about. Um, And I could keep Mm -hmm. asking questions, but we need to get to the conversation with our guest who studies. (laughs) He studies some of the things that we just referenced. So visual rhetoric, public memory, and how images can communicate very specific things in viewers' minds. That's exactly right. Today's conversation with Dr. Jesse Ohl was so much fun. I think we could have talked to him for over two hours, and I think Mm -hmm. we say that during the podcast. (laughs) We learned so much and had such a great conversation with him talking about public memory and how memories can be shaped by these images that we've seen throughout our lives, like the images that we kind of recall in our head from memory and then what we've seen seen in a mediated context, so much of it. Mm. I do want to let our listeners know we had some small technical issue at the (laughs) very, very end, and we lose audio for about four seconds, but hang in there. Um, Mm -hmm. Stick with us because you will definitely want to listen this entire conversation. Please welcome us in welcoming Dr. Jesse Ohl, an Associate Professor of Communication in the Department of Communication Studies, to our Revise and Resubmit podcast.
thank you so much for joining us today, Jesse. We are thrilled to be able to catch up with you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. So Jesse, I just have to say that um, I follow you on social media. I think you probably know that, but I saw this <laughs> post in the not too distant past that you were once the co- office's hallway but now you're the cookie guy that forces exterminators to have to debug the entire hallway and i have to wonder that you know like prior to this whole exterminator situation you were like the guy on the hallway and everyone's (laughs) favorite but now are your office suite mates maybe secretly asking to get moved away from you Oh my God, that was, it was the most surreal email I've ever received in my life. And I, I literally, so I, I get this email yesterday from uh, our, our office manager, Anita, who was like, Hey, Jesse, there's somebody in the hall, in your hall, won't name the name. So I got to figure out who I have wronged to begin with. And they were like, they called for an exterminator to kill the ants in their office. And then the exterminators followed the ants to your office where the ants had discovered some cookies and had been feasting on the cookies. And the cookies have now been removed. So if you're looking for your cookies, they're gone. And so uh, it's terrifying. I, oh, my God. Like, whose, whose office was infested? And get, you know. Right. You know, replace it some way. Um, but yes, no, I do feel really bad about that. I really do. Yeah, but it was just like it was like, how is this? How is this possible? And I literally had to go through my mind. I'm like, I didn't even know I had cookies in there. I really didn't. And so I'm like, you know, the, the ants had, had really been been, you know, going going getting getting their work done to find them. So so yeah, I've got to do a little bit of detective work to figure out who uh, had the infestation and apologize. <laughs> Well, I think, uh, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds so 2021, but I mean, also I think where we are in 2022. So. Right, right. I know. I was, I was a little mad, but then I was also like, well, you know, good for you, ants. You know, like, you're, you, you, know, you found the cookies. You found the cookies. You, you did what, what I could not. So good for you. <laughs> okay, Jesse. So let's shift gears slightly. Let's okay. uh, hear a little bit more about you and I'll ask just a couple of quick questions. Sure. So first of all, tell us where you are from. So I'm from a small town in Western Iowa called Denison. Um, uh, about a population of about 7,000 and it's uh, about an hour uh, east of Omaha, Nebraska. So sort of kind of on the Nebraska Iowa border. And I have a lot of family in, in uh, Nebraska as well. So kind of going forth uh, from, uh, you know, family gatherings to, to events to, you know, gatherings and things like that has um, been a big part of my, my upbringing. But yeah, no, definitely, definitely a, mid, a Midwestern guy. Nice. And when were you at the, well, this is kind of a strange question, but when were you a student at the University of Alabama? Yeah. So I got my master's degree uh, at UA and I, uh, from 2008 to 2010. And so I uh, had the, um, the, the fun experience of being here for sort of Saban's first <laughs> championship <laughs> with us, right? I remember it was my first year where we lost to Tim Tebow and then it was the cool. second year where we made Tim Tebow cry. Nice. Um, and so it's, it's been very, um, you know, uh, surreal to see again, like kind of just how much the university has changed, um, how much the department has changed and, and how much the uh, city of Tuscaloosa has changed. And, and obviously a big part of that is, you know, we, we just kept winning and we kept uh, growing as a, as a you know, football powerhouse. And so that's been a real fun thing to witness. Yes. OK, so kind of keep going and where are you now yeah so now i'm uh back at the at, at the capstone <laughs> um i went on to get my phd at the university of nebraska and then i taught at the university of mary washington um, which is a small liberal arts school and was there for a few years and and loved it and then there was you know the opportunity to come back to ua and so i've been here since uh 2000 the fall of 2017 nice so what did the young Jesse think he was going to be doing when he was growing up? Did, did you always say, I'm going to be a professor? So, so really young Jesse wanted to be a paleontologist. Like Ooh. I was oh, I a it. dinosaur like addict. I mean, I really was like I had, 
you know, like all of the dinosaur figurines I could get my hands on and the posters. And, you know, I would just like, I would pick up rocks and I'd be like, it's a dinosaur tooth, even though it wasn't, you know, I mean, it'd be like every scene through, you know, what, you know, kind of piece of, of uh, paleontology, paleontology history is this, right? That kind of thing. Um, but then as a, as a freshman I, in undergrad, I was, I was actually a biology major. Um, and I really loved the lectures and the discussions about science, but I quickly learned the hard way that I just didn't have the patience for lab work. I was just really <laughs> bad in the lab. You know, it felt so much, comparatively, it felt a lot more disinteresting. And, and so uh, uh, then I, I switched my major to, to, to political science. Um, I was really heavily involved in the forensics team, the speech and debate. And so that really grew my kind of interest and expertise in communication studies. Um, it was my connection to forensics that got me to UA because I was um, one of the forensics coaches uh, under um, Frank Thompson. Um, mm -hmm. And all of that kind of sort of, you know, nurtured this interest in, in rhetoric and politics. And that kind of led me on the, on the journey that uh, I'm continuing today. Okay, so we're going to keep going down this this path. Although I I think I also wanted to be a paleontologist. And, and I, we're not going to go down that path, but I I just I not distinctly, but like I remember the a, a land before time. It was so oh, sad yeah. to me. really sad yep. for dinosaurs. I had those and little then, puppets, the, yeah, the, the land from, before time puppets. Oh, yeah, and then great film was very scary to me because I think it was like it was scary and because I was like is this gonna happen and <laughs> so, uh, yes okay but let's let's shift back um so can you give us an elevator pitch on your research yeah so uh I'm a scholar of, of rhetoric and and uh, that means that I'm interested in uh the persuasive force of messages symbols images um one of my mentors at the University of Nebraska was Ron Lee and he used to say, uh, where there is controversy, there is rhetoric. Oh, so, oh. I, so I'm interested in public controversies that relate to our shared life in a, in a democracy. Um, mm -hmm. I specialize sort of in, in war rhetoric, in visual rhetoric. And over the past years, in, in particular, I've become increasingly interested in, in public memory, partly because these are, again, those areas where there's just a lot of um, controversy and, and, uh, and tension. Um, I'll also say that a lot of my uh, research um, centers around issues of violence, um, mm -hmm. the way that words and images themselves are violent, um, the way that public arguments can sometimes perpetuate violence, but also the ways that violence itself can sometimes be used to communicate um, both symbolically, but also uh, materially. So uh, I'm, as a rhetorician, I'm interested sort of, again, like kind of on, on uh, discourses, you know, texts, artifacts, um, and the ways that our public discussions and, and interactions sort of shape how we, how we think, how we feel, how we act uh, politically. Mm. Okay, that all sounds really fascinating, and I already have a lot of follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. However, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit. Sure. You have to come up with a headline for what you consider to be one of your more interesting findings. What would that headline be? Yeah. I got a lot of traction for some early uh, scholarship I did on drones and boredom. Um, and I think the headline for that would be, drones are boring. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh and, and really what I was talking about with that research is the a lot of the ways that we talk about drones and a lot of the ways that drones are, are visually represented are in such a way as to essentially deflect public attention, right? Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, one of the things if you do, you know, a real deep dive into, into the re visual rhetoric surrounding drones is you never see drones actually firing missiles or, or, or weapons, right? They're just sort of hovering in the air stationarily. Sometimes they're not even in the air. They're just sort of parked on the ground. And so you kind of get this sort of sense that they're not really lethal or that they're not really um, active or, or uh, nefarious. Whereas if you're on the receiving end of a drone strike, it's a, much, it's a much different story. So a lot of the ways that we think about war kind of end up being funneled through this sort of inebriating or, or, or boring types of, of rhetoric. 
Um, more recently, I did a, an essay on the, the Bow Weevil monument in um, uh-huh. which was fascinating, which was just fascinating. I, I had, you know, that was sort of like my, you're here in Alabama, you learn about something that like is so Southern, you had no idea. And how do you make sense of it? And I think that, you know, after really carefully examining sort of, again, the history and the meaning of the, the Bow Weevil Monument, I think the headline there would be something like charming and fun statue conceals a violent past or, or uh-huh. something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but I love this headline uh, question. It's a, it's a fun one. <laughs> so I want to go back to something you had said just a few minutes ago. Um, and it was in the form of a, with just a statement where there is controversy, there is rhetoric. And I'm wondering, because you said a lot of what you've done kind of focuses um, or centers around issues of, violence. Can you elaborate a little bit more on on what you studied and what you found? Because while I can certainly see how it's true, it, it's just fascinating to me. And I would just love for you to uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So um, one of my first publications had to do with um, the visual rhetoric of, of lynching photography. Mm -hmm. Um, so lynching photographs were, um, used at the time as a sort of form of domestic terrorism, right? That the, they were used within white communities to create a certain sense of solidarity, but they were often circulated as postcards, uh, and they were sent around the, you know, and, and at the time that these were being circulated, you know, the mail was Twitter, you know, this was. That, that people communicated across great distances. And lynching photographs weren't just about white solidarity. They were also about uh, uh, intimidation and terrorism toward uh, black communities, right? That this is a reminder of the way that um, racial hierarchies are structured in America. And if you act out of turn or if you um, misbehave, this is, this is the, the consequence, that, that sort of thing, right? So that's an example of, again, a violent image that's that's used in a in a violent way. Um, now, getting back to again some of the work that I've done with with drones, drones are violent. Mm, okay. um, drones are deadly. Drones are destructive. But the way that we talk about drones and the way that drones are depicted actually kind of forecloses or or um, obscures our ability to understand that violence. Right. Mm-hmm. We don't we can't it's, it's not overt in the kind of way that a lynching photograph is. And so what ends up happening as a public, we just kind of turn our back on it. Right. Like we don't really I mean, it's not the kind of way that war used to be conducted in terms of like having people sort of sacrifice their bodies and, and being on the front lines and, you know, the draft and all that. You, you have increasingly a reliance on you know, technological power in, in, in the form of, you know, drones. And so because of that, we don't really think about war the same way. We, we don't hold people accountable in the ways that we used to. We just kind of allow violence to uh, occur. And, you know, maybe we hear about it, maybe we don't. But the kind of connection there is uh, a lot weaker, right? Mm-hmm. War in that case, or violence in that case, is able to occur, it's able to perpetuate precisely because we don't think about it and see it in a, a, a very visceral or, or material way. So uh, some of the cases, again, are, are sort of the ways that, um, that images make violence more possible, right? Mm-hmm. Or the way that sometimes rhetoric can actually, um, you know, itself be violent. Um, I have an essay that's on the, uh, the, the Moab, the, the, the mother of all bombs. And this was uh, a projectile that was dropped in Afghanistan in 2017 and mm-hmm. was sort of one of the ways that um, then President Trump tried to kind of like flex a certain type of American uh, masculinity and, and, and potency. And so I, I use that essay as an example to, to demonstrate again how we use armaments, we use projectiles, we use weapons, not just to sort of to destroy, but to say things, right? And that weapons can themselves kind of communicate messages both uh, to domestic audiences, but also to to uh, international audiences mm-hmm. as well. So um, again, a lot of different ways of, of 
uh, thinking about it, but but it does bring us back to this sort of like, how does rhetoric or, or public discourse, how does that uh, way that we understand violence and, and sometimes choose to be violent or sometimes, you know, forgo that choice and entirely and, and let other people um, decide to, to, to do what they do. Hmm. Okay, so I have yet another follow up question. Um, as a former photojournalist turned photojournalism professor, I used to yeah. tell the students, you know, that very cliche phrase, a picture can tell a thousand words and you know from my perspective I always felt like you know images can be in some cases so much more powerful than the words um but there's so much open to interpretation so what I'm wondering is in what your study and you study visual rhetoric specifically are you looking at how, you know, see the, the images from the lynchings or the images from specific conflicts or wars? Are, we, are you looking at how one image is communicating certain types of ideologies? Or are you looking at the way we as the viewers are looking at that photo or both? Yeah, yeah that's a great question, Kim. And, and, and yes, it is. It's really both. Um, I think that when you take images seriously, you kind of have to think about them on their own terms, right? And to mm -hmm. think that images have agency, images do mm -hmm. things, right? Like they have certain capabilities um, that are not entirely reducible to words, right? And we can also talk about sort of the way that images and words often work together, right? Or can mm -hmm. amplify each other. But there, there is a, a, a gap or a remainder, right? Like a, a, that you can't in, in a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand words do exactly what an image can do. Um, but the rhetoric, I'm, I'm interested largely in how images are picked up and appropriated and used by audiences, right? So if we think of images uh, as a type of tool, right? Like what are people doing with that, with that tool? And that's where I think um, the, the interest in, in reception and circulation and, and uh, controversy and, and use by the public is really very key. And it's funny because I'm, I'm teaching a course right now on visual rhetoric and we were talking about this, this just yesterday about sort of, you know, are, are we, are we today in the digital age when it's not that the problem is there's too few images, it's that the problem is there's too many images, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do we make sense of the decision as a researcher to study a single image, right? Um, I think increasingly now, it, it's even if you're uh, looking at an image, you're really looking at an image ecology, right? Like yeah. you think about memes, for instance, where it's like you really with, with any you know, input of, of energy, you, you begin to recognize that there's no one image, right? That even if you're trying or, or trying to track down the original, right? It's like, that's, I think today it's, it's kind of a futile um, exercise. And so you're really trying to think about sort of like, again, a, a, maybe a genre or a cluster or a, or an ecology mm -hmm. of, of images, even if you're kind of trying to look at the same image or an, or an image of the same event or multiple images of, of, a, of a same event. But it's a lot more complicated, I think, simply because of the way that the production of images has become so uh, democratized, right? Like, sure. we're, we're, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, like, we're all, uh, you know, carrying around what, what would have been the state of the art, you know, Cameron. photography and film studio yes. you know in the 70s and 80s everywhere we go you know and so um, there's a lot of power to that but then it also can be um complicating as a public too because now again like we have fewer images that help orient us collectively because everybody can see mm -hmm. images from from such a different um perspective or multiple perspectives yeah so Jesse, I have I have a question um, for you. You mentioned that you were involved in the forensics team mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in each debate, and that's so verbal. And you know it, the the way that that the the team members like put together their speeches 
um, you know, it's, it's words. It's, I mean, oh, I know sure. there, there are some images sometimes that with your informative speech or, or whatever, but you know, it's very word heavy. So how, like, did that, was that part of your, uh, uh, let me back up. How did you get to doing the research that you're doing now? And was speech and debate and forensics, did that play a role in that? Well, I think that broad terms, I think things that I've been able to achieve professionally, I can track, track back one way or another to, to, speech and debate um just because i mm. i was so well coached and and supported and um mm. just learned i mean the first time i ever flew on an airplane i was you know 20 years old going to texas for a for a forensics tournament. So, I mean, forensics just really opened up my life in all kinds of of different ways um but to your particular question regarding the visual it, it's it's fascinating to think mm. about um the relationship between visual rhetoric, what Deborah Hahi calls rhetorical vision, and mm. rhetoric and persuasion, even when it's verbal, uh, and this mm -hmm. goes all the way back to Aristotle and you know the ancients. It, it's it's about using words to create a picture in the mind mm -hmm. of the audience, right? So that's visual as well, right? So when you're thinking about really great orators, right? Or when you're thinking about even like the work y'all are trying to do, like with a podcast, right? Like you're trying mm -hmm. to evoke images in the mind, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's there between physical images that are uh, evocative or arresting or um, energetic. And then also the way that words themselves um, can try to, to, to imprint or uh, materialize certain kinds of uh, visualizations in the mind as well. And so that's another reason to, to be thinking about the, the, the verbal and the nonverbal or the, you know, the image and the word as, as, as really a lot more interconnected than, than we sometimes give them credit for. So I'm going to shift gears on you just a little bit. I really think we should have planned on recording for at least two hours for this conversation, <laughs> but I want to try to shift so we can hear even more about what you do. Um, you had mentioned that you were teaching a visual rhetoric class mm -hmm. right now. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about the, all the different classes that you've taught and if maybe you have a favorite, because I think I want to be a student in your class right now. <laughs> perfectly honest. Oh. Yeah, well, you should ask some of the students that are in the class before you sign up. Um, so <laughs> I've got, yeah. <laughs> um, so at the undergrad level, I typically teach um, COM 310, which is our rhetorical criticism class. And that's a fun class. It's our sort of our writing intensive course. It's a methods course where, you know, you, you try to think about sort of um, communication research more from kind of like argumentative standpoint in that you're trying to make an, a, a, an argument about the way that a piece of rhetoric is or isn't working or has or hasn't done something kind of in the public. Um, in my grad classes, I, I've taught visual rhetoric. I've taught public memory. I typically teach every other Um, contemporary rhetorical theory, um, which is sort of like a foundational course for our, for our grad students. And then I've taught a few sort of topics courses. So like I said, I taught um, a class in public memory, which was really fun. But in um, spring 2020, so like right as, um, you know, the, the pandemic descended upon us, uh, I taught a, a special topics course on fascism and demagoguery. And that was really, really fun. Um, there, there are... Uh, <laughs> lot of there's a lot well, I mean it's terrifying and terrible um but it was great right. it was great it was a it was a it was a fantastic group of students and it was just such a timely discussion you know like there we, yeah. we started talking about kind of the different ways that you know fascism has evolved over time and the reasons why now you have just I mean you know, 10, 15 years ago, you, you, you wouldn't have seen people talk about fascism the way that they're talking about it today, you know, not even just mm -hmm. here in the US, but, you know, really throughout throughout. As we're dealing with these sort of really large existential threats um, regarding climate change and nuclear proliferation and disease, um, we need to have good 
solid um, ways of responding. And, and one theory is that the best way to respond is us all kind of figuring it out together. And that's democracy. And another way is that, hey, we need one person to take the reins and do this now as fast as possible. And that's and that's fascism. And so having that conversation about sort of like, why is it that you have this sort of uptick in uh, fascist and, and demagogic rhetoric? And what do we do about that? And how do we kind of come up with um, defenses for uh, democracy, especially again, in the digital age, when things are moving so quickly, that the kind of slower pace of democracy sometimes feels like it's a, a disadvantage. And so that was a really fun class. And that because, you know, that we were we were together for sort of like, you know, 12 weeks. And then, the you know, we're like, hey, we'll go on for spring break. And I'm like, maybe I'll see you when we come back. And I never did. <laughs> you know, we did, we did, we did Zooms after that. So that was a really, that was a really fun course. But um, those are, those are some of the classes that I, I have taught. And like I said, right now, I'm teaching the um, PhD seminar in, in visual rhetoric, and it's been going, going great so far. So Jesse, I have a, I have a question. As, as scholars, you know, we're often studying um, problems. Um, and the, the work that you do seems, I mean, it's, to be honest, it seems like it can be really heavy. Yeah. Um, how, how, does, how does your scholarship affect you as a, yeah. as a person? Um, and you know, how do you, how do you make sense of that and, and deal with that? Yeah. Well, well, sometimes is knowing that you need help. Um, and you know, one of the reasons why we reschedule, uh, this, um, discussion is because I, I, I'm, uh, seeing my after this. And so I, I need to, I need to talk to somebody. I need, mm -hmm. I need a little bit of, uh, of help. And so sometimes it's, it's just the, the humility and the honesty to, to recognize that you, you can't make sense of it all by yourself. And that, um, if you kind of tackle too much at once, it, it, it can, can kind of break you. Um, yeah. I think that the research that I've been doing recently, I've, you know, in some ways I've been doing this kind of research for a long, for a really long time, but now it feels just so much harder precisely because the world is just hurting. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've found that, you know, my scholarship is just really kind of gone uh, at a much slower pace and I've had to take different um, approaches to it. And it's not, it's not always easy, but I, I'm trying to, to think a little about research um, as a type of, uh, of joy. Um, mm. And, you know, we sometimes think about joy as like a happiness, right? Like things are good. And I'm, um, but Deleuze talks about joy as, as a, as an expansion of capability, right? Mm. So that when we're joyful, we just feel like we can do anything, right? Or you feel like you're taller or that you can stretch further, or that you can, you know, run faster. That joy is about kind of like, again, feeling as if you're, you know, more than you were before. And I think I'm, I'm really trying to, to tap into a little bit of that more and more and to, to think about writing on these topics um, as, as a way of reconnecting not only just with myself, but with others. I think that, you know, whether it's through co-authoring um, mm -hmm. or, or just being in, in contact with the communities and the people and the mm -hmm. activists that um, are, are interested in these issues, one of the ways that this kind of sometimes uh, troubling research can get to you is it can be isolating. You think that you're yeah. just sort of by yourself. Mm -hmm. and so, and I, but I know that other people are feeling that as, as well, even, even if you're, you know, um, researching relatively, you know, lighter, or, 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 <laughs> you know, topics. Um, but yeah, I think that that's something that, again, I'm trying to do more and more is sort of make sure that I'm sort of uh, sequestering myself, but uh, connecting with people, knowing that that's where a lot of the, the, the sort of the strength and the resolve comes from. Mm. Yeah, I mean, th thanks for sharing that. Because I, I do, I think, I think you're right. We, we often feel like, we're we're doing this and it's good and it's and it's it's meaningful and it's yeah. but um but not having that those moments of self-reflection and check-in like mm -hmm. it, is this affecting me and how mm -hmm. yeah knowing that if you're doing it the right way it couldn't not yeah right i mean yeah. like you know if you if you 
care and you know I I'll do like it it inevitably impacts you and so I I think that at that point you just you you have to be kind of honest with yourself and again sometimes it's just a matter of sort of taking taking breaks I'm a, I'm a really big fan of um, sort of the 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 movement the the slow scholarship movement mm-hmm. you know as sort of a response to kind of like our capitalist modes of of production where it's like you have by the time you get one acceptance in a journal or already have submitted the next article to be in that journal, you know, like that kind of thing where it's sort of like, you know, you can't even stop to, to, to enjoy an accomplishment because you're already two accomplishments behind. I mean, like, I think that that, that can really, you know, break people. And so yeah. I think that we, we, that it's another thing that again, I'm trying to cultivate in terms of, you know, not necessarily producing more, but producing better, I think. Mm. Yeah. My goodness, Jesse, I literally, we could talk for another two hours. Um, <laughs> truly, this has been um, just so interesting and fascinating to me. And it, one of the things before I asked you the last question, eons ago, when I did my dissertation, my dissertation mm-hmm. was on storytelling of war and conflict. Yeah. And I was looking at still frames in microfilm yeah. and microfiche um, <laughs> of war for a hundred years and to kind of tie it back to something that you had just said um i finished that dissertation and defended and i never looked at it ever because it took such a toll on me looking at all these images and so you know i think you've said so many things that we need to tell our peers in academia and graduate students and i want to echo what annalise has said thank you for sharing that Yeah. We do, well, well, just real, real quick, Kim, I want to yeah. say like that, that's so interesting because, you know, we've, we've been colleagues for a while and I never knew that, and, you know, I mean, I knew that you had worked with, you know, photojournalism and had done a lot with sort of the, 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 the magazine on campus and things like that. But I didn't know that connection to, to war rhetoric and visual rhetoric. And, and it, it's again, like, you know, maybe uh, something that we can talk about and try to figure out if it, you know, if it's possible, if, if we want it, right. Um, yeah. ways of, of maybe supporting each other with that research. But I completely understand, you know, I've, I've, whether it's, you know, there've been a lot of projects where I'm like, once it's done, I'm like, that was great. And I got to move on with my life and I'm doing other, I'm doing <laughs> right. other stuff. And I think yeah. that, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that too. Well, we always like to wrap up the podcast with an optimistic note or a hopeful note. So we're going <laughs> to shift the conferences. Is there a conference that you're looking forward to attending in the future when we return to in-person conferences? Note the optimism and hope. Yeah. 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 So I don't, <laughs> I, I don't necessarily have a specific conference, but I do want to, in this new kind of like phase of my career, I want to be more intentional about trying to do international conferences. Mm -hmm. So um, I typically, my favorite domestic conference is the Rhetoric Society of America, RSA. It's a, it's much smaller, but it's just rhetoricians. And it's also, you know, sort of like, you know, 40% folks in calm and 60% folks in uh, English, you know, you throw in a few folks from American studies. So it's like, it's a very kind of like fun interdisciplinary, you know, group. That conference is fantastic. And I, I that there's um, a lot of learning that I uh, can can undergo by not only just traveling abroad more, but but traveling abroad with the intent to do scholarly stuff. And so, um, you know, there's there's for instance, there's the you know um, the African. They have a, a con. Last year it was in Kenya. I'm like, oh, that would be fantastic. Um, before the pandemic hit, I was going to a, a visual conference that was supposed to be in Australia and that got canceled. But I definitely think that that is the thing that I'm most excited about, partly because I think that that will also be the most challenging for me. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I still, you know, I, I have traveled abroad, but I haven't traveled abroad as much as I uh, would like. And I, I think that I, I need some of those kind of culture shocks and those sort of, um, you know, difficult situations to kind of help, you know, sort of push my, my thinking and my, you know, personality a little bit. So I'm excited about that. If it comes, when it comes. Right. <laughs> I love that. Um, this has been so much fun, Justine. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing um, with our listeners a little bit more about who you are and what you do. 
Um, this has been so much fun. Thank it you has, so much it, for joining us. Thank, yes, absolutely. And thank you all for, you know, um, having this conversation take place in the podcast for the faculty, for the students, for the, for the college. And so I really appreciate your leadership and service with this. Absolutely. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you. I want to take just a minute and thank you all so much for tuning in to our Revise and Resubmit podcast. We are really thrilled and, and grateful to have the listeners who tune in week in and week out. So thank you. I also want to tease our episode next week. Next week, we're talking with another PhD alum from the College of Communication and Information Sciences, who is now a professor of public relations at Central Michigan University. We cover so much territory in this episode. We talk about her working as a journalist in Russia. We were uh, talking about working as a communication specialist for NGOs who were really working to help tackle HIV and AIDS also in Russia. We talk about how she wound up here in the United States, going through graduate school, and then kind of how it led into the wonderful professional career that she has right now. So tune in next week, Dr. Alina Urzakova. Great conversation. You don't want to miss it.